I come from Edri and I'll be moderating the next session on news dissemination. And I will come over here. So, first I'll uh, go and introduce the speakers. Can you hear me? Is that enough? Yes. Um, and then they will uh, make their opening statements and then there will be a uh, discussion between them and give it to you for the Q&A. Um, before we begin, I'd like to ask the ones that have a red dot to sit uh, perhaps in the back uh, so that they are not being filmed. Um, otherwise, keep your uh, location. And well, without further ado, I'll start. To my left is Frederike Kaltouner. She uh, leads the Privacy International's programmatic work on corporate surveillance. In 2018, she has co-authored a book on data justice with Nikolai Publishing in Berlin. Um, next to Frederike is uh, Filip Stojanovski, the Director of Partnership and Resource Development at Metamorphosis Foundation for Internet and Society from Skopje, Macedonia. Currently, Philip is managing the European uh, Union supported project, Critical Thinking for Media Wise Citizens, CreThink. This promotes media literacy as a basis for safeguarding the rights of citizens to hold diverse opinions by stimulating a culture of critical thinking, pluralism of opinion, and democratic values. Next to Philip is Eva Shimon. Uh, she works uh, for Civil Liberties Union for Europe, a Berlin-based human rights NGO, uh, in a position of advocacy officer for freedom of expression and the media. She previously worked for the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union as the head of freedom of expression program and served as a member of the executive committee. Uh, finally, but not least, uh, Dr. Nathalie Marechal is a senior research analyst at Ranking Digital Rights. She leads uh, RDR's methodology development process to expand the Corporate Accountability Index in order to include new company types and issue areas. She holds a PhD in communication from the Anberg School at the University of Southern Carolina. So now what I want to do, other than sit down, I will uh, quickly try to introduce today's topic with a characterization of news consumption done by Eugenia Mitchellstein in her research in 2017. She calls news consumption incidental. And incidental means that users get their news on mobile devices, part of their constant connection to the media platforms. They encounter the news all the time rather than looking for it but they only click on them sporadically and spend little time engaging with this content. So it is important to remember that they click but don't engage much. The news grabs their attention, but it doesn't keep it. So when we're talking about news dissemination, it's important to note the important role of attention in the business model of online social media. So I would like to ask uh, Frederike, to explain a bit how far does the business model of these platforms go to grab the attention of uh, online users. Thank you very much. I would like to talk about three different points. The first one is I would like to explain to you uh, Privacy International's approach to the topic of misinformation or our framing. Then I'll mention a few of the work that we have done and are planning to continue to do. And I also want to give you a little bit of a heads up that for those who know us that our structure is changing a little bit and then we'll have a dedicated program that works on democracy issues. Um, so I think the, this panel is now about misinformation, but a lot of time there's a tendency to, to lump a lot of things together. Fake news, and I'm like fake news, misinformation, filter bubbles, micro-targeted ads, bots, Whenever I talk about one topic, for example, with journalists, it quickly becomes the other. Um, so the, the key question is, what are we really talking about? And our approach has been to, to make a distinction between three different layers and address them separately. So the first one would be the content level, what you just mentioned in your introduction. So that is the news that people either seek or are discover or are, or are exposed to. Secondly, there's the platform level, 
those are the intermediaries that shape what kind of news people seek or discover. And those are both the platforms of traditional media as well as social media platforms. And the third level, which is our main focus, is um, the data ecosystem level, the, the back end that, is, that lies behind both the business model of media companies and of platforms. Um, I think it's important to, to remember um, that governments who are now tasked with regulating misinformation uh, are also very active in spreading misinformation. Um, and in many countries around the world, they are also very active in, in censoring um, news, in censoring speech, and in cracking down on the freedom of the press. So in a way, I think uh, the term fake news, um, which is why I try not to use it, is has been a field day for authoritarian governments around the world who, uh, who um, now have a very good narrative to continue cracking down on journalism. So I think that's really important to remember and keep in mind. Um, I think I'm running a bit out of time, but the, just a small note on the content level. Um, I just looked up the numbers. TV is still the most used platform for UK adults to find news. So as much as we talk about new and different things, for many people it's still very traditional. And the second thing, and this became uh, evident in a scandal that recently happened in, in, um, in the US that sparked an article in the New York Times that said, never tweet for journalists, is that old media of, and, and journalists are also very, of course, they also seek and discover news. And in, when, it, when it doesn't go well, it's journalists also... Uh, are targeted with misinformation and spread it. But at the same time, there are also ways to discover social movement and, and activism that, that wouldn't have been possible in a previous way. Um, I'm not on this time. Sorry. Two more minutes. Um, just one note, um, I'm scared. I think there are many different ways that people seek and discover news, and it's, I think this is highly complex. And I would be very careful to say, um, I would be disagreeing a little bit with the introduction to say um, this is very different for, for different communities uh, depending on your media usage and I'd be very careful to simplify it. Um, one note on platforms. Um, so we don't really focus on the content level. We also don't really focus that much on the platform level even though people like Claudia who will be speaking in the next panel are doing excellent work on this. Um, but I think it's important to remember that Platforms are proprietary, opaque, complex, and highly automated systems. Um, so the places where we discover news or where we're trying to find news run on a certain particular business model, which means they have an impact. Of course, they have an impact to draw attention. I think it was Zainab Tofenji who said, in the past, um, the main struggle for freedom of expression was who is allowed to speak, and this has shifted slightly to, this is still an important issue, but in addition, the key question of our time is maybe who is getting attention, and what is getting attention, and what are the logics behind it? So I'm skipping a bit, this is like a talk, and I'm summing up in five minutes. So the key focus that, that sort of like my, the program that I'm responsible for at PI looks at is the back-end system, system that is shaping both the business model of publishers, and publishers can mean anything from click farms to very traditional news media, as well as uh, it's also the business model of platforms. Um, and there are complex relationships that, that that business model, the tracking, the profiling has or shapes, of course, to a certain extent, the content that is created. It has an impact on the feed and recommender systems that are optimized for engagement that then shape what kind of content gets attention, the business model also supports targeted ads or sponsored content that, that can itself contain information. But the other thing we're interested in is sort of that these resources are very, are very vulnerable and what we've seen is that a lot of people can hijack them, make use of the same targeting uh, mechanisms or uh, can, can make their content viral as well as the data itself that these systems collect can be tapped into by all sorts of people. Um, so basically, two things that we have been working on is, one is, um, and I wanted to say this at the beginning, we now have, so I'm, I'm working on, on, a pro on our work on corporate exploitation, but as of, I think, two weeks, we'll have a new area that focuses on democracy, uh, and they will be looking very specifically at elections and at targeted ads during elections. So I can't speak that much about it, but the, 
in the corporate program that I'm working on, there have been two things that we've been doing last year that we really want to continue. And one is um, we've been filing complaints against a number of data brokers, ad tech companies, and credit referencing agencies that form the back-end system and use and misuse people's data in ways that go way beyond the expectation of many readers and are an integral part of the system. The second project that we've done, been doing recently was we have been um, doing some research into, into third-party tracking on Android apps <laughs> and uncovered that Facebook tracks non-users um, like there are many, like some of the largest apps in the world send data to Facebook the second you open them about people who don't have an account. This is not narrowly about advertisement, <laughs> but in a way, and I think that's a, it's a hard point to make, but sort of our, our approach to this issue is like this is all connected. And this all, um, we don't just want to look narrowly at misinformation, but there is a systemic issue that is that happening here. And this is what we want to focus on and tackle. Thank you, uh, Frederike. You mentioned virality and you also mentioned the use of governments and their role in the disinformation slash misinformation uh, context. And so it is obvious that this, this business model is not only a business model, is, it doesn't only have an economic incentive, um, but also a political one. So I would be curious, Philip, to hear your, um, about your experience when it comes to political and economical incentives to virality, um, situated, but perhaps not only in the uh, Macedonian uh, um, uh, sphere. Hmm? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, Thank you, Andrea. Uh, so is, is, the, is this good for the... For the mic? <laughs> okay. Um, I come from Macedonia, which is uh, in the news in the recent years, uh, more often than before, for several reasons. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, most famous reasons uh, is that uh, it was uh, identified as a source of a so-called uh, cottage uh, industry for fake news, which have supposedly influenced... Uh, uh, elections in other places and uh, it is um, I would I would like to um, refrain from a usual Balkan practice of starting each discussion with an one hour of history lesson <laughs> <laughs> minimum <laughs> but uh, I will provide some sort some uh, little pieces of information about the context because I think it's uh, it's useful as we, as a country, have passed through a full circle of uh, populism, uh, which is experienced elsewhere. So we were um, a candidate for, uh, we, were, we were a country which became independent in the early 90s, started a process of democratic transition from uh, communism, being part of uh, former socialist Yugoslavia, towards uh, democracy. And at one point, um, the process reversed. Instead of uh, gaining uh, the um, features that would make us uh, a member of EU and NATO and fulfill the criteria, we started to uh, backslide. Uh, and in the last, uh, in the years between 2008 and 2017, we were basically uh, a state which was in a state of state capture, it's called. It's a situation where a political party or center of power uh, occupies all the institutions of the state and works uh, and employs them, uses them as a resource or as, or as a tool for their either economic or political or combined gains. And uh, it took a lot of time for the international community and, uh, to recognize this because there are all other sorts of uh, Game of Thrones likes political intrigue involved around uh, you, uh, uh, the former Yugoslav uh, space. Uh, and uh, um, they include uh, bilateral relations with EU members, which were blocking the, uh, the entry into EU, to regional problems such as uh, possibility of inter-ethnic conflict or uh, geopolitical problems of using these problems to basically ruin the European project for all. 
<laughs> and uh, uh, so generally what we had as a government was um, a structure which used first made a capture of a certain powerful political party and then it uh, made a capture of the state through a legal means, through an election, but then created conditions of uh, basically being impossible for them to be voted out because they installed their people in all the instances of uh, branches of the government. And how, how did this translate in the media landscape? Uh, this, uh, in the media landscape, basically the party controlled most of the media. It was very similar to totalitarian uh, experiences in Europe in the past. And it's very, s uh, and the model has been replicated in other countries uh, around the, the region of Europe. For instance, the enlargement, the creation of media conglomerate in Hungary, or the takeovers of certain media um, uh, businesses in um, Serbia by government cronies. It is a very similar model. Uh, in the sense, um, it, is, um, it was not a full-fledged dictatorship. And uh, even though um, they tried to create an illusion that the people are f uh, for them, which is a goal of all populists, uh, there was a, a movement for uh, that uh, f first, um, thanks to whistleblowers within the government, exposed the corruption through uh, by leaking uh, some data long story <laughs> and then there was this was a basically a um, one of the key factors that gave boost to a pro democracy movement in the country which also included protests and various kinds of other uh, activities that finally led to a free and fair election uh, which uh, led to a new government which and is now pro-democratic. The media sphere, in this sense, was basically hijacked. And let's say I wouldn't, my percentage would be very, let's say, rough, but I would say that maybe 90% of the media worked for the government and the rest were either intimidated and by different types of legislation, such as defamation laws, or uh, they were, uh, and they were not uh, steering the pot in a sense. And a uh, very few media, only online or mostly online, were uh, being doing the work of journalism as it's supposed to be, as a guardian of democracy and society. And this is one point that I would like to make. Uh, it is very important to um, differentiate between media workers propagandists and journalists. Very, very often the term journalist is applied to anybody who produces to any type of publisher, but uh, it is, or w media worker. But uh, it is really hard to differentiate. Once the, uh, this type of trouble starts, it is very uh, crucial uh, to differentiate between journalists who base their work not only on using certain technology, but also on applying a certain set of standards which make them members of a profession, and the uh, propagandists. What we had is basically uh, that the ruling party tried to, to establish information dominance, so to flood all the channels with their messages, and we had a plurality of sources, but not plurality of thought. And uh, this uh, started also, this played into the idea of flooding both the social networks with uh, uh, links from various websites, which were not only official websites of news organizations, but even uh, uh, workers within these uh, news or media organizations started opening their own websites, which copy-pasted the content which was given by the party to the media, and then to the, and then disseminate it further. And they all got state money, one way or another, to do it, either through advertising or through some sort of subsidies. Right, so the, the political uh, push was obvious when it yeah. comes to uh, this particular and, example. Uh, yes, and then on top of it, we, we, uh, this created basically a situation where everything is possible where the ethical um, frames, uh, framework of journalism uh, 
was uh, not part of the public uh, uh, sphere or the public consciousness. How, how is this connected to the situation in Veles? Because that was, I don't think any Americans went there to say, here, pose this. Yes, it, uh, so Veles is a small town in Macedonia where a lot of uh, websites were discovered to be registered from. Websites which were oriented towards the US audience and which had a look and feel of a news website, but usually produced news which were copy-paste of uh, basically um, party propaganda against uh, certain politicians, or uh, were um, versions of normal news which were perverted or skewed with added uh, uh, material uh, to, to look like, uh, to be more interesting, more clickbaitable. <laughs> and uh, in my opinion, this was not, uh, uh, I, I, um, this was a result of another development. The, this development was that there, were all, there was already like a cottage industry of people who were trying to make money on the internet by, through Google ads or other ads. And they were publishing websites or WordPress blogs about different kinds of topic. American football, health diets, healthy living, uh, Formula One racing, what not. Anything that could bring them clicks. And then they hit the mother load with uh, US elections. They realized that by combining uh, the properties of the platforms such as Facebook, where they would open maybe hundreds of uh, they would basically replicate the mode that was introduced by the government, uh, uh, how can I say, media dominance empire, which is very similar to the models that are applied in Russia or elsewhere. And uh, they used it for their own commercial purposes, but they exported uh, content that was detrimental to democracy abroad. And uh, the whole atmosphere, and I'm going back to this issue of media literacy and why critical thinking is important, is that when there is a society where these norms and this knowledge is absent, and that's why we need media literacy and critical thinking to be top priority of the educational system, not just of certain NGOs, is that uh, this erodes the trust in journalism, but the propaganda still works. When journalism disappears, all that is left is propaganda. And even though people distrust this media, they, by uh, conditioning, by these psychological mechanisms of repeating and amplifying, they acquire certain uh, values or negative values, or they, or they become apathetic, which is good for the anti-democratic forces. And uh, um, that's why I think it's uh, important uh, to to combine both this soft approach to increase the knowledge besides uh, of the consumers and of the institutions and of the journalists because uh, and then in order to be able to work together in uh, right. with the technical people yes. thank you so much philip um, now that you mentioned uh, the impact of uh, this information and um, how does it translate into uh, elections and people's um, integration of the truth from the news? I would like to hear a bit from you, Eva. You are a co-author of a um, report by um, Liberties, Edri, and Access Now called Informing the Disinformation Debate. And you, you um, raised this point there that uh, there haven't been any studies on the actual impact on disinformation. Um, before we even think about solutions to this information, we haven't really looked at this. So what, what uh, would you comment on the topic, Eva, and a bit more about the report? Okay. Like. Thank you. Um, so exactly, so what, what had happened is that the commission set up a high-level working group inviting different stakeholders to evaluate the online dissemination of, of this information. And there were so many people invited, except for human rights organizations. Um, so we applied both Edri, uh, Access Now, and Liberties, but we were 
excluded or we were not invited, so we decided to set up a, a shadow working group and uh, try to give feedbacks and feed the whole discourse with the human rights angle of, of this uh, of this topic. So what we did is that we published a report that reflected on the Commission's uh, high-level working group's report. And what we found is basically what you already mentioned, Andrea, is that there are no data. And if we, and if we don't have data, we don't know, you know what to do. So the first thing would be that we need research and we have to understand what this information, what kind of impact it has on society, what kind of impact it has on news consumption, public discourse, and then we can create certain benchmarks and indicators to understand the situation and then reflect and offer certain policy measures. Um, but we had other critics. Uh, I can group our critical uh, remarks in four groups, and then we came up also some kind of solutions or some um, some suggestions. There are three of them. So the first one is the the missing part, the research that we would need. The other part, which we we we, uh, we were rather critical, is the fact checking solution. So it seems that there is an agreement at the policy level that fact-checking is very important, and we share this regarding journalism, and so fact-checking has a very important uh, role in certain issues, but for uh, disinformation and disseminating online disinformation, it has a very limited impact. So what we know is that uh, fact-checking information are much less viral than disinformation, uh, and there is also one problem with the fact-checking solution so far has been offered by policymakers is that they are trying to involve private companies and the private companies and platforms, um, we have some certain issues. So first of all, they are not arbiters of truth. Uh, it's neither their interest nor their design to decide between uh, facts, truth and false information. And it's also important that, I mean, as these organizations or these companies work, they sell election influence services. So they are not very much involved in this whole process. Maybe they are also part of the problem and not the solution with this regard. So only slowly relying on these companies would be a failure regarding fact-checking solutions. Our third critic was artificial using artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies. And uh, we believe, I mean, as the, the three organizations concluded that uh, machine learning systems alone won't be able to solve this problem. So we can rely on these techniques and it's important to rely on these techniques. But the, what's very important and we must ensure that the design and the development of these technologies take human rights in, I mean, respect human rights. So this is the question of the design, because we can say that these technologies are neutral technologies, the question of how we use them. But only relying on them wouldn't solve the problem of, of, uh, of this information. Our fourth, and this was the, the last main critical point, is regarding anonymity because this is what comes from different EU level organizations and also national level from the EU countries that anonymity, I mean, uh, limiting the possibility to anonym communication would solve this problem. And this is something we totally disagree with. So what we believe that encryption and anonymity provide individuals the, the possibility to freely communicate and exercise their right to freedom of expression and also to ensure their high level of privacy and undermining online anonymity in the hope of countering this information is just a huge mistake and we don't support it at all. On the other hand, we try to be cooperative and uh, try to feed the whole discourse with some certain solutions. I group these in three, so I'll be brief. I know we are running out of time. Uh, first of all, we evaluated that it would be important not only address this information, 
but address also the manipulation business model. So if we focus on the business model uh, and the business model that creates the eco chambers and, and understand that the fundamental business model of certain companies such as Facebook who are using micro-targeting advertisement, uh, that's that's the whole problem. So it's not itself the content itself, but the business model behind. Uh, what we came up with the other solution is preventing the misuse of personal data in elections. So that reflects to the PI approach maybe, or it can be connected. Uh, that it shows that, uh, I mean, what we have seen lately, Cambridge Analytica and other scandals shows exactly that misusing personal data and targeting people with this information have certain impact on society. So it would be good to have a policy level decision, national level and maybe also at EU level, that there are certain requirements throughout election periods such as transparency, so how certain data are used, the limitations of uh, targeted adv ad advertising or behavior advertising for political purposes, and maybe also sanctions for this type of activity. So it's not in general the misuse of personal data, but the legally acquired data in electoral process would be a certain kind of activity for that special sanctions could be applied. And the third and the last suggestion we had, it reflects the media literacy, and we agree with the, with the Commission's research in, with this regard, and not only focus on, on young people on the on educational level, but also for elderly, because according to numbers, I mean, the most likely people share online disinformation, it's more likely the elderly people, so we also have to focus on them. Thank you very much, Eva. Um, we understand that it is very important and we're, when we're talking about EU and government regulation of this, um, of this uh, complex um, environment that governments and politicians also um, tackle their own uh, political campaigns as well and not only pretend that they're not part of the problem. Um, Natalie, you um, mentioned, you wrote in your research on uh, Russia's internet policy that Russia does not view internet governance, cybersecurity and media policy as separate domains. Rather, it is seen all as information security for the Russian foreign policy. And so, you introduced two important terms uh, in your research, network authoritarianism and the geopolitics of information. Um, I would be curious if, um, do they only stick to the Russian politics? Uh, do they go outside of this uh, political, uh, of the Russian political landscape? Could you go a bit more in detail? Thanks, Andrea. Uh, no, these concepts are absolutely not limited to Russia. I happen to write a paper about Russia as a case study of, of these dynamics, but it's much broader than that. Uh, so. What is networked authoritarianism? Uh, so it, networked authoritarianism, which some people also call digital authoritarianism, uh, is it's a, firm, a term that was first coined by Rebecca McKinnon uh, in relation to China. And what she means by that is uh, that it's a political system that leverages technology policy, media regulation, and uh, levels of extra legal repression to create a situation in a country where some expression of dissent is allowed. Think of it as a pressure release valve, perhaps. Um, but it's not allowed to actually gain traction. So an example of that would be how in China, on social media platforms, uh, it's, it's pretty well tolerated for people to individually complain about environmental problems, about local corruption, um, various problems that they encounter even if the 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 their their, con their their speech their expression is inherently critical of the state but what is not tolerated and what is taken down and censored very, very quickly is any attempt at collective organization, any attempt at forming any sort of a social movement. Uh, and that's why there's been such um, uh, 
uh, quick and, and strong crackdown of uh, feminist movements in China in particular, because any type of a social movement of people banding together to create change uh, through any channel that is not through the party itself is is a is a threat to the survival of uh, of the party, or at least that's how its leadership sees it. So China, Iran, Russia are some uh, pretty uh, some very prominent examples of of this dynamic, uh, but it's much broader than that. Philip touched on that uh, in respect to uh, to Macedonia, but this is a model that is spreading very quickly uh, and has been for some time uh, in these both because uh, these three countries that I mentioned, China, Russia, and Iran, are actively helping countries in their sphere of influence. Uh, so in, in Southeast Asia, in the Middle East, in uh, the former USSR and fo former Warsaw Pact uh, zone, uh, but also because um, and, and they, but also because it's something that's inherently attractive for tactical reasons to, uh, to many governments and political parties. Uh, now, when I say that they're actively promoting this, let me give you some examples. Uh, so China and Russia, along with Kazakhstan and a number of other um, dem democratically dubious countries uh, in, South, in, uh, in, in Central Asia, formed uh, something called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, where basically they trade tips on how to use uh, technology and media regulation and uh, uh, just the right amount of extra legal repression to, um, to, to control their populations and, and maintain uh, stability and uh, the authority's ability to retain power, uh, as well as their ability to remain rich kleptocrats, right? Because that's a big part of it, is being able to enrich yourself and your family uh, by, by virtue of being in a position of power. Um, so it's kind of like uh, the OSCE, but with completely different values. Rather than promoting democracy and human rights, it's all about subverting democracy, uh, rejecting human rights, um, all for, for fun and profit, if you happen to be the person in power. So at the same time that this model is uh, becoming entrenched and, and, and spreading around the world, in California, where I went to graduate school, uh, something called surveillance capitalism emerges in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, and we talk a lot about Facebook as being uh, the, the, the big bad wolf here, but it's really important to remember that it was, it was invented at Google and it was perfected at Google. And if anything, Google is much better at uh, keeping its dirty business away from its uh, user presenting products uh, than Facebook is. Facebook is made a series of uh, poor decisions that led to the bad PR that it enjoys today, but make no mistake that this all came from Google. And Google is still doing it, and that Google, it is in Google's advantage that we all continue to focus on Facebook and ignore Google. So let me just plant that seed uh, in your mind. So what is surveillance capitalism? So I saw a number of nods, so uh, I'm guessing that at least some of you are familiar with, uh, with the term. Uh, it's, a, it's a term that was coined by Shoshana Zuboff, uh, who is having a book launch event tonight at the CPD, C, CPDP uh, opening reception. So if, if, if you can make that, I think it's going to be a fascinating discussion. And she describes it as a, log a new logic of capitalist accumulation that treats human beings as sources of data. So in the same way that Traditional capitalism uses nature as a source of enrichment, right, of natural resources uh, that are then uh, made into uh, value-added products and, and commodities and, and energy. Uh, and we're seeing the results of that today, right? I mean, there was a big climate march just a few days ago here in Brussels. Uh, I think everybody here is, is sensitive to, uh, to the climate crisis that we're facing. Uh, the seeds were that were sown uh, in the 19th century in, in, in England and, and elsewhere. And so in the same way, the surveillance capitalism business model treats all of us not as people, not as users, not even as products. You know, it's not, it's not wrong to say that if you're not paying for it, you're the product, but it's even worse than that. You're not the product, you're the thing from which the product is generated, right? The real product is the data. So all we really exist as uh, for these companies are as um, things from which data can be pulled, right? We're, we're the minds. The real value is the thing that is being taken out of us. And this data, what is it used for? It's used for ads, yes, but what is ads? Ads is the means of behavior modification. Right? No advertiser, whether it's somebody selling you rain boots or Chanel clothes or chocolates, is doing that because they're not hoping to influence your, your behavior. Right? Pol political ads are all about influencing your political behavior, whether that's voting or, or some other mode of action. So ads are not innocent. Ads are about modifying your behavior. 
ads are about ultimately about controlling and influencing what you do. So what does this have to do with networked authoritarianism? Well, networked authoritarianism and surveillance capitalism both use data to, uh, to automate people and control behavior, right? So the only meaningful difference is that one of them is primarily motivated by financial profit, as Frédéric was talking about. The other one is primarily motivated by political power, and that's what Philip was pointing to. But the ultimate destination is the same, and I don't know about you, but that's not a future that I want. <laughs> so what do I mean when I talk about the geopolitics of information? So the geopolitics of information is when uh, countries use the tools of both networked authoritarianism and surveillance capitalism to interfere beyond, uh, beyond their borders in the international system to advance their own country's interests, however they define those. Uh, so let me give you a few examples of, of phenomena that, that I see as fitting uh, into that. And there will be many, many more, right? Um, so for example, China providing facial recognition technology to Zimbabwe, what's that about? That's about gaining access to uh, the, both the natural resources uh, in Zimbabwe and uh, elsewhere in Africa. We know that China is very concerned uh, about that. Uh, but it's also about being able to get more data about faces that are not, uh, that are not East Asian, right? Because we know that facial, uh, facial recognition tech that is trained on, uh, on a certain population and not others is going to be very bad at recognizing uh, other uh, faces that look different, right? And in particular, because of, well, 500 years of racism, uh, the, the, the most of the algorithms have a harder time recognizing black faces than, uh, than non-black faces. And uh, getting access to Zimbabweans uh, faces, literally, is helping China gain, uh, gain a competitive advantage in facial recognition technology. Another example, of course, uh, that I won't belabor, but is still important to mention, is Russian in election interference starting in, uh, in Eastern Europe, in the former Soviet Union, but more recent, and, and in other countries that did not get uh, the attention that they deserved uh, because, again, the, 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 the international power system and, and media economy being what it is, uh, but more recently, the Brexit referendum, uh, US uh, elections uh, attempted, in, well, interference that happened but did not have the desired results in France and Germany uh, and elsewhere. Um, are the, so these are all really negative, at least from my point of view. Can there be positive uh, uses of the geopolitics of information? Well, um, while, while I am, well, actually I should add one more negative one uh, because while I am, I am an American, uh, I actually am strenuously opposed to this particular policy, among, among others, is the US government's promotion of Google and, Fa and Facebook's commercial interests. Now, all countries, uh, to the extent that they're able to promote the financial interests of, uh, of their own companies uh, abroad, that's a, that's a fairly normal practice, uh, normal in the sense that it's, it's widely accepted and widely practiced, but that's a big part of how Google and Facebook uh, have become the dominant players that they are today because they had uh, the backing of the US government helping them uh, in trade negotiations and, uh, and so on. But perhaps a, a more positive uh, uh, example of, of the geopolitics of information would be the GDPR's extraterritorial reach. And so it's, it's of course, uh, too soon to, to make any kind of uh, definitive judgment about the impact of GDPR. It's been in place for, for less than a year. It takes a lot longer than that to be able to measure the impact of, a, of, of sweeping regulation or legislation of, of any kind. But I personally am optimistic uh, about GDPR um, make it, adding friction, making it more difficult uh, for, these com for all these companies, uh, political actors, uh, and, and various other entities to, uh, to take data, to convert it into the raw material that's needed for both networked authoritarianism and, um, and surveillance capitalism, which, again, are basically the same thing. The motivation is different. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie. I'm, I'm, I would like now to open a discussion between you. Um, when it, uh, you can um, perhaps um, start with uh, the point that you consider most important. Is it, is it um, the political aspect of the online dissemination that represents the biggest threat? Is it perhaps the lack or the decreasing trust in media um, that that gives us 
no um, no intermediaries, so to say, but to get in touch directly with our politicians, or rather have our politicians get in touch directly with us? Is it the economic uh, ecosystem um, behind it? What is it? What is the biggest issue in the whole complex? I think it's everything. I think it's actually impossible to separate all these issues from one another. Uh, and that's one thing that I actually think the, the, the Russia's foreign policies approach gets right, is by treating all of this, domestic media regulation, uh, the economics of, uh, of media and online industries, uh, foreign policy objectives, domestic policy objectives, they all, uh, it's like a puzzle piece where everything fits in perfectly together, where it all makes sense, right? Russia has certain policy objectives at the level of internet governance because it furthers its ability to uh, control its own population and, and expression mm -hmm. uh, internally, right? Uh, it's, uh, it, it, it has certain uh, perspectives on uh, encryption, for, for example, or so-called uh, legal access to, uh, to to user information because it's it helps both with uh, domestic surveillance of, of opposition and and human rights activists uh, among others and because uh, it helps when it comes to external surveillance uh, and so my my argument is that um, we the, the the liberal democracies of the world and its people need to find a way to have a similarly comprehensive and cohesive um, an internally consistent policy that supports, uh, as my colleagues on the panel have said, uh, human, human rights, democratic values, uh, and everything else. So the question for me is not so much which is more important, but what is the, uh, the avenue of attack that is uh, most likely to be successful, and what should the strategy be for, uh, for achieving that? I think there's a very liberal um, assumption with the word misinformation, and the assumption is that once people have the right information, they will vote for the right people, meaning democratic, non-populist. And that's a premise that's quite, I'm not convinced of, to be honest. Um, that's why I think we're seeing, I mean, if this is your premise, the consequence of this is to see very, very narrow definitions of the problem, of both like targeted ads are manipulating people to vote the wrong thing, people don't can't receive the right information. And I think it's interesting when we shift the topic not from like politics in the election narrow sense, but it's important to recognize that politics is broader. Uh, our partner organization in, in, in Mexico had malware or like they found people having malware on their phone because they but people who advocated against the sugar tax. So it means sort of like politics is broader than that. And it's interesting if you look at, and, and I think it, it goes back to, you're right in the sense like the line of attack has to be, yes, authoritarianism, and at the same time, there's a systemic problem with the way that data is used in online platforms. But more concrete than that, I'm not seeing, it's really, really complicated, and I think it's important not to rush to conclusions. And one example that I wanted to give that moves a little bit away from politics is health. Um, if you're a young woman and you are looking for diet advice on YouTube, this is, a, a, this is a nightmare. You see like YouTube channels with millions of view, uh, views that basically propagate eating, dis normalize eating disorders. You, you get like information about what is healthy that is definitely not healthy by any standard VT or like health standards. And I think that's sort of like, Oh, that's really complicated. We don't want to censor people, but at the same time, their business model is their livelihood depends on, on their channels and selling ads. And of course, certain content gets more clicks than others. But I honestly don't see, I don't have a really good solution to this other than to say that the systems that we really need to, we need to tackle the way in which these platforms propagate certain content, in which they sell people's attention and, and in which they are optimized to keep people hooked and drawn towards certain kinds of content and, and the ways in which the tracking that goes behind it is, is terrible in its own way. Um, but I just want to, I think it's important to be honest that this is a really, really hard problem and maybe we're not dealing with one problem but with several different problems to which there are different solutions. All right, um, I think this, uh, I agree with <laughs> the esteemed colleagues. Yes, we need a comprehensive approach, uh, 
uh, and uh, we are talking now more about ideology than uh, than anything else because um, we come all f uh, I assume from this background of the enlightenment saying the reason is the the top mechanism for survival of human race and humanism or human rights approach uh, is something that is uh, our own only barrier to the horrors which were uh, part of World War II in Europe and elsewhere. And that's why we need to establish this, this system. So it's both practical in a sense, because that has been, uh, like Churchill said, democracy is the best system, is the worst system <laughs> in a sense that everybody criticizes it, but nobody comes up with some better solution. <laughs> or something like that. Uh, so, uh, uh, but uh, it is uh, also, I think, important to get everybody uh, on the line. I think we are very much atomized, even within the civil society, even within the organizations, even our attention, uh, which is split, even within our personalities, we don't divide in enough time to solving these types of problems because we our attention is always grabbed by different things, both constructive and non-constructive. But uh, it is very hard within this uh, space of co contemporary media to uh, come to uh, a mutual understanding. I think it's a, it's a much wider problem than uh, the disruption tactics that are used by the authoritarians. And we, they are not only used by uh, high-level authoritarian, let's say more powerful ones, like all these low, uh, uh, let's say, uh, small countries which aspire to become despotic countries under the uh, mask of uh, democracy, they all use different tactics of lobbying, of misinformation, feeding into the big centers like Washington and Brussels to further both their goals and to basically uh, undermine the, the sources of democracy themselves. And uh, that's why I think, uh, and I agree about, uh, we are fact-checking organization, by the way, also. And we see that uh, fact-checking is not, uh, I mean, is not valued by the journalistic professions, even by the professional journalists who are, who are not propagandists. Uh, it is, they haven't come to the understanding that to report about a certain fact-check, is as important as to report about the certain about the statement that was false and that was given by the politician. It is um, even the the types uh, we have to rethink many of the established assumptions, including how the uh, news organizations uh, set their priorities of, of what to report and how. And I think we should retain this um, because we are ideological from the from this uh, background that I mentioned. We should uh, stress this um, self-regulation in journalism, and possibly get all the media producers, which are basically all the users of social networks and more, to uh, get acquainted with them, so they could be able to. Uh, evaluate the content that is fed to them. Otherwise, uh, somebody mentioned uh, the um, more senior generations. For them, television, they, uh, usually you cannot hear them They differentiated. I saw this on Channel 5 or I saw this on, they saw it on television. They d you don't get uh, the differentiation of websites. So uh, they saw it on the internet and that's enough. So it's- uh, It must be true. <laughs> oh, it, oh, right? That's the next step. <laughs> but the, uh, we d don't even have, uh, some of the social networks are now introducing some sort of, um, uh, let's say, solutions, which rank uh, sources of information or sources of uh, content more broadly as trustworthy or not trustworthy. And some of them uh, allegedly cooperate with fact-checking organizations. That could be uh, moving to the right directions in getting fact-checking more impactful. Right. But uh, um, if, it's, if it's just makeshift yeah. solutions uh, which are not part of a big system, or which are integrated also in the, uh, uh, in the education system by the states, and to start from 
from the kindergarten for the kids who are hooked on YouTube since they are two, uh, to get them understand what they are getting, mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, ineffective in right. uh, leading to the results of the re of your report. I think. Thank you, Philip. Uh, Frederike will make a one sentence comment and then it goes to Eva. I just want to say in the in the Brexit campaign f fake new fake facts were printed on buses. It's sort of like that's not an old media or new media phenomenon. It's sort of there's a sh a cultural shift in where where it's suddenly okay to make blatantly wrong statements and get away with it. Thinker runs quite deep. Um, yeah, so what what I what we have heard is just shows that we are really facing a very complex issue. But if I just would like to warn that we shouldn't overestimate this online disinformation and the impact it has on democracies or so on democratic societies. So the my un so if we want to protect democracies and liberal democracies, we also have to protect free speech. And if we protects free speech, we don't only protect truth, but we protect also stupidity, believing in flat earth. We, I mean, there are so many things all around us and people has the right to believe and to talk about things that are not true. Uh, first, second, I think for the authoritarian regimes that's a different story and maybe it would be better to split and try to address the problems in different ways. So when there is an authoritarian regime that feeds its people with disinformation and clearly false information and propaganda and closes the whole media system or reshapes the whole media system, to have a kind of one channel media system, meaning that in every single platform you get the same information that's fed by the government. That's a systematic failure of the media system in that country. In other countries where the liberal democracy still operates, you can see different sources and among these sources there are disinformation, there are misinformation that people share why they believe that it is true. And there is a big difference between those information when someone shares something knowing that that's a false information that the election day is on a different day. So trying to target people with disinformation while someone believes in flat earth and tries to convince their Facebook friends that the earth is flat. Mm -hmm. And I mean, targeting and trying to solve this issue, it's just, it's, it's not one problem. I mean, it's, it's content issue, it's a systematic media question, and it's a question of different governments, how, trying to, how they're using this new kind of media system, or on the other hand, setting up a new kind of media system. What, he, what we have been seeing and following in Hungary, in, uh, in Poland, in Bulgaria, and some of the Eastern European countries, how after 20 years of democracy, the whole media system is turning back to a less colorful media system and how the media system is captured by these governments. So I, I just, my, I mean, to, to sum up, it's just, we also have to take into account free speech and also focus on the different kind of democracies and, and non-democracies. Right. Uh, one last comment. Natalie, yeah, very, we'll a very small comment uh, on, on free speech. I agree with you about, about free expression. And that's why I think, um, per, the, personally, that uh, the, most, uh, the, the most important thing, uh, the most important uh, tactic is not to uh, regulate content. I mean, some, some content regulation and content moderation, I think, uh, is, is, is is inevitable and, uh, and and perhaps necessary, but more importantly, different uh, different people and different uh, in different contexts can uh, have reasonable disagreements uh, about that. Right, the pol the policy that is correct for uh, that is appropriate for one country may not be as appropriate for uh, a different. Uh, national and political context, but that regulating uh, the business model uh, 
I think is something that is uh, that is globally ap applicable, uh, and that it's not it's not a content problem so much as an infrastructure problem. And it is possible to regulate the infrastructure uh, of influence and control that was designed for uh, commercial advertising, but is uh, exploited by uh, all kinds of malicious actors, however you define malicious actor, that we can regulate that infrastructure without uh, infringing on freedom of expression. Thank you, Nathalie. So we have a few minutes left now. Um, we will uh, give it to you, the audience. Uh, if you have questions, please raise your hand. Hi, thank you very much for an interesting panel. Um, uh, as Frederica mentioned earlier, this kind of propaganda, fake news, is not a new issue. It's been there since Roman times, um, demagogy and so on. Uh, it's just multiplied tenfold because of the internet and platforms and so on. But none of you mentioned the money. Um, in the, we, we all know that in the US and the US uh, elections is the party that collects the billions of dollars and has the advertising space on the internet, on TV, whatever, that actually can dominate the media. And so rather than regulate freedom of speech or regulate the internet infrastructure and so on, why not address the way that the financing of those that, you know, the powerful that give money to all these politicians to um, make their propaganda. I mean, do you have any comments on that? I'll keep that very short because I don't want to be that American who's not in the US and tries to make everything about the US. Um, I agree with everything you said. Um, but um, there's a lot of reasons why, there's a lot of powerful political interests in the US uh, that disagree with your premise, which again, I agree with, uh, but I think that's a, that's a US. Uh, right, well, in, in short, I agree with you and I think it should happen and it's not happening because people who have power and money don't want it to happen. It's but not just fight for it. I don't think it's just about the US. The Electoral Commission in the UK made a point to say that they think that the law is insufficient and the scandal that, that around the Brexit referendum was as much about uh, campaign financing as it was about uh, online political advertisement. And the problem was that in campaign financing and everything, online ads are treated as separately from traditional advertisement. And that's why the money that people, that is being spent there is less regulated than everything else. So I think this is a really, really crucial component. I didn't go that much into it because it's more covered by the democracy what we do, but I think it's very, very important um, to look about the role of, yeah, the role of money. Just, just a quick remark that this is why we suggested that for the elect, elect right before the election period, and this is different in every country in the EU, there should be some separate targeted regulation, so more transparency needed, and there can be some limitation on the advertisement, and that I wouldn't say it would solve the whole problem, but it could address somehow the problem you mentioned. Philip, would you like to reply, or we take the... Well, well I, I, I think that there are many countries where you can overtly finance campaigns and there are limits and there the system is subverted by uh, illegal financing of the campaigns. Starting from, uh, I think Ireland is now tried to do something about not uh, allowing ads paid from abroad to be shown for political purposes for their own election referendum types of activities. But, uh, uh, it is uh, actually, uh, you're raising a very fundamental question. How our system is structured? Uh, and this, this goes, uh, I mean, we can connect all this also to, to the other aspects of economy. People uh, in the Eastern Europe, in my opinion, who agree with the uh, disinformation and propaganda, don't actually, most of them don't actually believe it. But they do it because the regime is providing them with some sort of 
um, how can I say, benefits yeah. or uh, promise of benefits. And it is really hard to, to go that deep unless we agree that we need fundamental social change, basically a real re revolution of how humanity manages this earth. And uh, this is beyond our scope yet. <laughs> for, Next for now. year's privacy camp, we have a theme already. <laughs> okay, other questions uh, in the audience? Mm. Very good explanations. <laughs> we have, yes. If you would like to come up here, or I'll, I'll try to repeat your question. Or. Thank you so much, everyone that's holding this wire. Um, uh, a quick question on, uh, we've touched on uh, political campaign advertising. Um, I wanted to ask that given that the, the kind of, me the, the direction of travel in especially online advertising is towards very small audiences, and we've seen a proliferation of um, especially campaign advertising and different types of adverts targeted at different people, whether you think um, regulation is sufficient here because there's presumably going to be a, a greater and greater challenge for regulators to stay on top of what is actually being spread, um, especially in terms of misinformation in political campaigns. Oh, yes. Uh, hello. Um, so my question was, you were mentioning as a recommendation uh, lim um, limiting uh, uh, or having the requirement to, to have certain limitations of targeting advertising. Um, my question is, uh, why don't you try to recommend also the forbidding or prohibiting the sale of data for, public, uh, for political purposes? So is this something that is considered? Um, especially selling data for political parties because they what they do is that they collect data from uh, online shopping facebook and uh, any other data they do this and uh, add uh, to uh, the the data that the party has already and like this they can start mapping um, the people and dividing uh, what is uh, useful uh, in terms of uh, uh, what kind of messages uh, this could be given to to to, to the people, to the community, so they bring these different data communities. Is this something that uh, election is really important? So I think regulation should be stronger in this regard, and this should be foreseen prohibiting. Okay, uh, I'll be brief and uh, answer the second the second question, and then I pass pass the mic. Uh, I, I think you're right, so that's, that's, the, that's one of our biggest concerns when political parties or non-political parties, but, but people's data, I mean, uh, for political purposes, these data are accessed somehow, so, and, the, and here, here we can rely on GDPR. So what, what we believe and what we have to assess now how GDPR works, because if you don't consent for that purposes, your data cannot, cannot be sold for these purposes. Uh, putting certain and further limitations would be very, could be very effective on paper. The question is how we implement the existing new data protection but of course we would need like the e-privacy regulation that's pending and we would like to really push for that. So there are certain other means to use to protect users' data. Um, what we can see at the moment that the EU is really taking the steps and, uh, and hopefully, I mean, with the e-privacy regulation we are rather disappointed, but GDPR was something very important and because we believe it will have the spillover effect and it will have a spillover effect on the US-based companies or hopefully will have, that can, that can trigger that we can save these data more effectively. But I'm pretty sure that for these we would need litigations. I mean, we have to prove that, that this is something happens, that we have to cases to the court and make sure that these companies understand exactly that this is something forbidden. 
Thank uh, you. I think Natalie can can go into uh, details regarding. I think uh, Frederik. I just want to add. I think there is a massive enforcement gap, not just when it comes to GDPR, but also Google has advertisement policies, and they're like being violated all the time, and there is a they're not being policed adequately. And I also think, in addition to Regula like I see blatantly GDPR violating websites every single day and I'm still waiting. We filed complaints, but sort of I'm a bit tired of saying it's regulation because we have regulation now and we're still not really, we yeah. really, really need to file these complaints. But I think there are other really smart, I think as civil society, we need to think about judo moves that we can do to, to hack the system and there's a unique opportunity at the moment to actually do that. And those are things like lobbying, the platforms is like when it comes to app tracking or targeting ads on apps, completely out of the attention of most people. Lobbying um, the operating systems uh, to have, have stronger policies, making sure that they enforce their policies. There are all sorts of avenues, and I think our role is as much actually not just asking for new regulation, but also pointing out violations of the law or even like platform policies and terms and conditions and make sure that they're actually being enforced. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I think um, I, th I think between Federica and, and Eva, your, your question about, uh, you know, is regulation uh, going to be enough uh, has largely been answered, right? Regulation, sure, but also what regulation, right? I mean, the, the tech companies, we see this, uh, Certainly, I'm observing this closely in Washington, and I, I understand that similar uh, shenanigans go on here in Brussels. Uh, the tech companies are trying very hard to push for uh, privacy regulations that um, cosmetically look like they're going to do something, but that actually they can work around very easily. Right. So my, my, my personal litmus test is that if Google and Facebook don't strenuously, and the Comcast cable uh, tel telco lobby don't strenuously hate a law. It doesn't. It's not strong enough for me. So that's that's kind of my litmus test. Um, but the uh, the last point that I want to make is that there's a real temptation, and this again is something that the the tech companies and telcos are typically in favor of, of having one set of rules for so-called political content and political advertising, and another set of rules for commercial advertising. And that, at face value, s seems to make sense. The problem is that this requires drawing a line between what is political and what is not. Exactly. And if we start to draw that line, what's going to happen is that all of these um, all sorts of actors are going to start pushing ads that like just skirt the line on the side mm -hmm. of commercial, but actually have uh, a political uh, valence and a, and a perhaps an, a political intent. But of course, you can't measure intent, right? So, so I would caution against having two sets of measures for political versus uh, allegedly non-political content, uh, because I think that line is just too difficult to draw in a meaningful way. I think, uh, like you said, the enforcement or the implementation of the laws is crucial. Even, uh, for instance, in Macedonia and uh, other EU candidate countries, and maybe some of the many of the new members, uh, the laws were basically aligned with the EU regulation. The data protection law uh, basically protected the, the data of the people who were misused by political parties. However, it was not enforced because the judiciary was captured too. It is really important to, uh, and the people lost trust after, uh, I mean, most of this uh, uh, negative, uh, um, how can I put that, tendencies have to do with uh, lo loss of trust. We uh, create our reality based on trust. The people who were fighting fascism were trusting that they are doing the right thing and they did it in the World War II. Now, I think um, unless we uphold the institutions, uh, it is useless if we have um, even the perfect laws. Even if we can agree of what's the perfect law to regulate any of the issues that we, unless there is a mechanism to enforce it, it is, uh, it is be the first uh, precondition for, the, for prevention of future crimes. So monitoring the way the laws are actually enforced could not be such a bad idea when it comes to this. Um, I, we're already five minutes past, and I feel that our audience is quite hungry. Um, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, we'll wrap it up now.
and uh, enjoy your lunch. Please don't forget to take your uh, stuff with you. And let's give it a hand for our panelists today. Thank you.